Good afternoon and welcome. My guest today is a shareholder and founder of a spa at a hotel that's been described very recently as, and I quote, a beautiful place with a fab spa with the friendliest staff. She's been a director of the spa for 18 years. Welcome, Kathy Ball of Calcutt Manor. Hi. Hi. Kathy, how did you get into the spa business? Well, my background is I trained in hotel management. So I met Richard, who's the chairman of our company, at, on our first day at what was Oxford Polytechnic. We did hotel management, went off and did different things. And he opened Calcutt with his parents 35 years ago now, I guess. And uh, I came down and did some marketing work for them and ended up staying. Uh, so I did all the sort of back office stuff, the HR, the uh, accounts, all of that stuff when it was a, a very small hotel. And um, Richard's parents retired out of the business and the local family in, invested in it and continued to allow us to develop it. We were kept on. And when the plan was to build what was really quite a brave and large spa for the day, this is going back to, you know, early 2000s, um, I was eventually asked if I'd like to go and run it. I think originally we thought, well, we'll take on somebody with masses of experience. But when we came to it, that, that it's a separate building for starters. It was a standalone business. And it's those small touches in the hotel, how you run your business, how you deal with your customers, how you deal with your teams, that we felt was quite a difficult thing for somebody who was completely new to the company to come in and, and, and manage a spa and make it feel like part of our hotel. So it was suggested that I moved over and I just, you know, I, I bit their hand off and I moved across. And I guess what I brought was the business knowledge and we recruited, you know, a brilliant beauty manager, a brilliant fitness manager, and I learned from them, they learned from me. It ended up being, you know, a very strong department of the hotel. And I went on a very steep learning curve with the support of Jean Oliver, who was the consultant at the time who helped us open the spa. So, you know, queen of spa, taught me all I know. And um, it went from there. And I've absolutely loved it. Absolutely loved it. How, I mean, how has you have you how have you seen the business change, and the spa business change over those eighteen years? Any key things? Um. Well, the, the audience has grown as the spa business has grown. I mean, I guess you know when we first started, there were very there were still very few spas, and ours was you know we, we were probably only a twenty five bedroom hotel at the time, and we put on a two and a half million pound spa, which wouldn't buy you much now, but actually, you know, ours is quite a, um, a, a large and independent business. Um, so- Have you noticed the way that client, clientele have changed or not really? Uh, well, it's interesting actually, yes, because we, we opened with 350 members. We had an, another 150 that joined, uh, I think it was four months later, so that we didn't feel that rush of a new membership at the beginning. And until the, the pandemic, where often where we have realistically lost some of those founder members, but I think probably at the point of closing in um, March last year, we still had over 80 of our original members. So we've all grown old together. And um, it has been interesting because actually, um, even despite trends, it is the members that are part of your spa that drive what your spa needs to offer. And, you know, you watch the average age and the average age has gone up as it's, it's not surprising. Um, but, you know, we've got 85 year olds that go in and get on a treadmill every morning. And we've got probably our most active class goer is certainly in her late 70s. Um, so, yeah, we've, we've definitely moved as the demand has moved um, treatment wise. You do it for two reasons, don't you? There is the trends and the demands of the customers. You also introduce new things to keep the staff motivated. So, um, yeah, I think we've, we have changed dramatically over the years, but stayed true to our sort of core values, I think. And roughly what percentage are members to guests in terms of the spa? Guests of hotel, I mean. Um, well, uh, probably the easiest way for me to... Um, I mean, obviously, in terms of revenue, it's almost 
well, it's certainly 40% of our revenue is, is membership fees. If you then look at our treatment revenue, which is the other, we'll call that 50%, and then there's bits and pieces. Um, of that, our hotel guests probably bring in about 35 to 38% of our, our treatment revenue. Um, our day spa probably the same, and the rest is split between our members. Very low, it's not unusual, I speak to other spa directors, very low on treatment, so it's all about fitness. And then actually one, one thing that I was hoping might crop up is that we actually have a very important sector, which are people that use us like a salon. And actually quite a lot of spas don't choose to do that. It's been mighty important to us in the last 12 months because they've been the ones that have come back through the door straight away. And actually they, they impact so little on the rest of the spa. So, you know, at times where we are very busy and trying to sort of manage footfall, that sector is actually really important to us because they come in, have a treatment, they leave. Um, so that is that's interesting the point you make so this these salon type visitors don't impact on the experience of the spa your spa visitors they don't cross they don't cross the lounge so they, they come to reception go upstairs have a treatment and they leave again and they're regular and they are uh, you know they they retail with us and so on and that can be 20 percent. and it's actually the same at barnsley which is obviously a different model that, that spa is, is geared to be predominantly for the hotel guests, but actually up to 20% of the revenue each month comes from people, and it's very remote, Barnsley, but people who choose to come and park in the, in the car park, come and have a Casey facial or whatever, and they might stay and have afternoon tea in the gardens or whatever, but um, I know there are spas that close the door on that sector. Um, I never quite understand why. You admit they, because, you know, I coming from London might go down to Colcott and make that as destination. But he, it's interesting the level of revenue you have from your locals and regulars. Oh, yeah, absolutely critical. Absolutely critical. And they'll be the first ones through the door on April the 12th. Um, you, you touched on, obviously, COVID. We've all had a, a difficult year, at, to say the least. Are there any particular actions that you did in lockdown that you can share that were that perhaps others could learn from? Uh, and there's still time, isn't there? So um, we did masses of training, training you can do in furlough legitimately. And, um, you know, it's down to uh, the senior members of my team who drove it. The provision from the um, product houses was phenomenal. Um, both Elemis and Aromatherapy Associates I'm talking about specifically, but I think Jessica were doing it too. Um, there was a constant tap of brilliant training, um, some of it to do with treatment, some of it to do with product, so that the team come back strong. They did it in the first lockdown, um, they did it in November, and it hasn't eased up at all in, um, in this current lockdown. And, and given the challenges they've had, that's quite a good... Oh, absolutely. Hats off to them. Hats off to them. It's been phenomenal. Um, the girls will be back stronger than they've ever been. Um, but I really do applaud that. And then, of course, our internal training as well. Um, we've had all our health and safety training brought up today. It's just been a good time to to make sure that everybody has maximised the opportunity of coming back stronger. Yeah. Um, other things we did, other things we did, we, uh, we actually invested, although we had no money, we actually also invested in an outdoor gym, which I know some spas have got that, we never have had, but actually what we were concerned about was protecting our membership revenue, and um, our gym is not huge, we've reopened it with a sort of maximum capacity of six at any given time, it's self-managed, our membership is reduced anyway, so that's all worked fine. But we knew that there would be people that just would not come indoors. Um, as I say, you know, the average age of our members is 59. Therefore, that gives us a lot of 70 and 80 year olds. And OK, lots of us have had our first vaccines, but actually we needed to maximise the chances of them coming back full time as members. And has and that been a success, the outdoor gym? It has been a success. Um, I mean, November is not a great time to try and sell an outdoor gym. 
But when we reopen this time, I think it absolutely will be. It's also now it's an asset that we've got forever. Um, and I still think even day spa guests and so on, it's now it's visible in the spa and it's very good quality. And yeah, I think that was really worth doing. Um, oh, we also did, sorry, we also did an online branded fitness platform. And again, I'm sure everybody has done that. Um, what this did was it forced us into doing something that we really should have been doing before. So the great thing about this is that we made it perfectly clear that nobody is to come to the spa as a member if they've got a drip on the end of their nose, a tickle in their throat. We will never have someone with a cough or cold in a class again. And now we have something to say, well, stay at home. This is a facility that we're providing for you. Uh, for people that are away on holiday, for people that work away, who wonder about the value of their membership, um, now legitimately, I think they feel as though they get better value for it. And this is for members only? This is for members only. And there are models out there that, you know, you can make money out of. We, we're not choosing to do that. We're wanting to see it as added value, really, at a time where you know, the whole membership thing is really, really stable until something like this happens. And then you realize how fragile it is. And I think anything that you can do to embellish the membership at this point um, is our best chance of recovering. Yeah. Now, you said you've been running the spa for 18 years, involved in the business even longer. What would you advise somebody starting out today? Uh, I would probably say um, work hard, um, work consistently hard. Uh, I'd say don't stop learning, read everything you can lay your hands on. Uh, if we're talking about spas, I say go and use lots of spas. You know, I mean, I think Richard and I spend more of our hard earned cash on going to spas and going to restaurants and going to hotels because we're genuinely interested and we learn something from everyone we go to see. Um, I would say, show your team respect. Um, it's much easier to go up the ladder if you are respectful of people. And I would probably say, keep fresh eyes on things. So um, I plague my team with wandering around the building and spotting things that are right in front of their eyes. And, and yet, you know, they can do exactly the same thing to me, to me when they walk into my office. So, um, being able to have fresh eyes on things, I think, is 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 a great um, advantage. Now, again, coming back to your time that you've been running the spa, what would you say was your greatest mistake? My greatest cock up was what you asked yes. me, wasn't yes. it? <laughs> well, um, it's seared in my mind. This, so um, it, it wasn't a difficult um, thing to recall. Uh, May the 22nd, 2003, at nine o'clock at night, uh, we were sitting in the spa the night before we opened with a glass of champagne, patting ourselves on the back. Beverly Bays was there with Neil and Tom from what is now Spark Studio, but this was them in a former life. Every picture had been hung. The place looked amazing. We went home only to return in the morning at 6.30 to open to our 350 long-weighted guests to find that the pool had emptied itself into the plant room. Oh my goodness. Water in, in the swimming pool. And uh, there was already somebody waiting in the car park, you know, to come through the door. So it was, um, you know, <laughs> you will understand why you don't forget a moment like that. No. Um, I, I go through the same horrors now. So my recent conversation with Scott, our spa manager is, is that Sunday night before we, we reopen, yeah, I don't care if you sleep there, I don't know what we're going to do, but there is no way that we don't open in peak condition on Monday morning. And he'll understand now why I was so worried about it. But, you know, we got through it and we opened the outdoor pool and we made bacon sandwiches for everybody. And most people, although of course not everybody, was very supportive and thought it was quite funny. And those that didn't find it funny have continued not to find anything funny over the years. So... Um, but we oh, but you still kept you still kept them then. Well, we still kept some of them, yes. <laughs> certainly, yeah. So Would you say that? that actually, my biggest cock up. Well, yeah, that. Well, um, and would you say that made your that most of the people more endeared towards you and Calcott that opening? 
Uh, mm, I'm not sure about that, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> All right, moving on. Um, staff and your team members. You know, we're opening in a couple of weeks' time. How would you advise um, fellow spa directors, managers on dealing with with staff? What, what have you got to say on that? Do you mean difficult staff, Mark? Well, <laughs> general, either either on bringing people back or. Yes, why not? Let's start with difficult staff. Well, you, you, I mean, you mentioned that, and of course, my mm. response, of course, is that I don't have any. So, <laughs> so clearly, we've parted company along the way. But actually, um, we are going to do our reviews before we come back. It's a great time to do reviews while everybody's off, and it gives us time to think about, you know, what what we want them to work on and highlight things that would help them to make them stronger in their roles. And yeah, my response to you was really going to be about reviews because we know how difficult it is to employ people. Um, we know how difficult it is when somebody is a bad fit and yet they are, we have, we have a, a, um, a, a word we use called wellness and wellness is somebody who either, she doesn't, I say she, he, let's say he, um, they're not so, dreadful that you think they shouldn't be part of the team but they also don't wow and actually sometimes we need to turn wellmers into stronger members of staff i think that um annual reviews and we actually do them we did them in the spa twice twice a year are the most exciting opportunity to find out what people are really in your business for what they want to do what we need to put in place for them to get there and I think it is only, it's, it's no good selling somebody in a probation review that they're absolutely brilliant. They've got nothing left to work towards. So somebody passing a probation review without a list of things that they need to work on that you will support them on is the starting point of being able to manage anybody because you've identified the need. You've identified what you promised to do. You need to check that you do that. If someone then is really struggling or there are repeated problems, you need a record of everything that has gone on. It's no good saying there was that time that they did this, there was that time that they did that. So actually my advice in terms of handling difficult stuff, which was the question that you sent me through, and I don't have any at the moment, but I have had in the past, um, would be that actually you need to be supportive, you need to record, you need to give them a chance. But actually at the end of the day, what you need to rely on to say, you know, this isn't a good fit, is a, an accurate history of their failings and an accurate history of the support that you've given them, um, which still resulted in their failings. So these reviews that you do, because some people have said to me, look, these are just box ticking exercises. We do them in a big corporate because we have to. They, you, they absolutely can not. be. They absolutely can be a, a box ticking exercise, in which case you'd do better not to do it. But I think actually, if you take, um, and I, I'm really proud of what we do in reviews. And actually, um, I don't think I'm speaking out of turn to say that it, it, it's, the, it's one of the things that we do better than the hotel managed to do for all sorts of reasons. We've got, you know, we've got 60 staff, they've got 450 across four hotels. And it, I recognize it, it's much easier to do it when you've got also, we've got, um, We've got people that also really have always believed that it's a worthwhile exercise. So if you do a review properly, we found receptionists that, you know, had we'd gone a little bit off the radar of knowing that they actually had a beauty qualification. Well, why are they not doing treatments? And it's a confidence thing or they had a bad experience somewhere else that they worked. And all sorts of positive things have come out of reviews. I mean, you know, it's one my regret that I don't get involved in every single one of them because... I do think it's, it, it, it's well, A, it should always be positive, but you always learn something. You always learn something. So you learn something yourself from doing it and you well, absolutely use them to support people. Yeah, so what Not we, just weeding what, out. No, 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 absolutely not. No, what we should do with, and ours are all about to happen. So if any of my team are watching now, if you don't get this, then come and see me. But um, it should be a, um, a, a review from the last records to see what we promised. 
that should all have been diary to make sure that we said that we did what we said that we would do. And then actually it's now oh, where are we going from here and what do we need to put in place to make that happen. And all sorts of interesting things have come out of reviews and actually I think my team do it really, really well. I think as a department, we do it very well. Good. And there are so many advantages that again, I struggle to understand why anybody would want to make it a box ticking exercise. Um, customers, we're now reopening. What are, you, what are you doing to bring them back? And generally, what are your better marketing or customer acquisition? modes well historically our membership has always been full so in terms of our marketing requirement the emphasis has been on the bits of the business that obviously need more support so we haven't done lots of marketing in the past we suddenly find ourselves in a position where we're asking our marketing department to turn their attention to us to help rebuild um and 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 this is really a first and it's 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 very interesting but I mean, I think in terms of um, why our customers come back, um, the customers that come regularly, other than those that are shielding or whatever, uh, will come back because we recognise them. Our staff, and we've got some you know, individuals that are exceptional, um, will recognise them, have made notes about their particular um, requirements, um, so it's that personal touch, that personal service. Yeah, I mean, Natalia, if she was sitting at her desk now, which she's not, but underneath her desk would be, you know, certain toweling slippers that somebody prefers to their flip-flops. And those will be for Mrs. Jones's visit in March. And people just love that if you can do it all the time. Um, and that, you know, this comes back to this consistency of service thing where it's no good if Mrs. Jones comes and Natalia's not on duty and she hasn't told Denisa that the, the slippers are under the thing. So it takes some work. Um, but being recognised, I think they absolutely love. And then I think it's down to consistency of these levels of service. So, you know, don't be brilliant one day and it all goes to pop the next day, dependent on who's in or who's had the training or whatever. I think people like to come and know what they're getting. And we make mistakes. Everybody makes mistakes. I make loads. Um, but I think also it's how you handle an error. Um, and sometimes that's the thing they go away talking about is how you handle the error as opposed to the error, if you see what I mean. And, and we all make them. Um, I think our customers, you know, you described in the introduction that our staff are very friendly. Why would you want to be anything but friendly to a customer walking through the door who you're going to ask to take their clothes off and their makeup off? So well, what about those really madly awkward ones you must have had? Well, how do you deal with them? Yes, I, I do have them. Um, I do have them. And again, I think it's where if it's a mistake, we put our hands up and, and sort out the problem. The issue comes when it's somebody who you actually think is wrong um, and we, we are entitled to defend our staff and we're entitled to defend our business and we're entitled to defend the way we do our business. But you, you know, it's probably the bit that I'm getting a bit long in the tooth for now and a bit intolerant and why it's time for me to hand it on to staff that are better than me at it. Um, so you'll, lose, you'll, you'll tell the customer when he or she's wrong then, will you? <laughs> Well, we have done, yeah, we have done in the past. And actually, it's always the first thing that you want to do, but you know you can't. Um, and actually, you know, I will now always pause before responding. And um, Natalia, who's my um, guest relations manager, who is so much better at it than I am now, particularly now where I am getting a little bit intolerant, will always go, no, Cathy, sit down and rewrite that. So we will, we will pause because actually being defensive it always ends in tears doesn't it and between Natalia and Richard my husband who I would pass you know a response to a, a, a complaint to will always go no you know this is just going to end in tears so back down but it is it is really hard it's, it's probably the hardest part of the business I think. Um, retailing how important is that for your group? Well it's interesting because I think um, in my my little spa director's circuit we were talking last week 
And, um, you know, from the beginning, understandably, the product houses are very keen and tell us that we should be doing, you know, 30% retail to treatments and so on, which we never did. Um, it is important, but actually, you know, I know it's a cliche, but my message to the team is if you don't do it, you're not completing the, the service. So the recommendation is the thing that is most important. What's actually changed, I think, dramatically in the last 12 months, and I, I, I don't think I'm alone in feeling this, is that the product houses have gone off the scale in terms of their online retailing. And, and you know, hats off to them. I, I have already said this to Elemis, you know, I get at least three emails a day on my various emails about what I could get from Elemis or QVC or, or whatever. And I think that is, it is going to be interesting to see the outcome of that. I mean, our girls are buying online. I've bought online. And of course they've got more margin to play with. There's gifts with everything. And it's hard for us to match that. So I remember back in 2003, sitting with our original product houses and um, you know, it, as in, in terms of choosing the product house to work with alongside Jean Oliver. And, you know, they'd be saying, you know, we drive all our customers to you at the spa and, and, you know, over the years, that's just done that, where actually now, you know, understandably, our entire regular Elemis customer base will have been buying from Elemis online, and who wouldn't, for the, for the entire closure. And whilst there's been lots in the press about, you know, you've got a retailing opportunity to do out of your spa during closure, in reality, and I, I, I hope I'm not the only one that feels this, I know I've spoken to others that have said the same, it, it, it hasn't been worth it. And, you know, some, I might be shot down in flames for that, but, you know, the first inquiry that came in and I, Fran was gonna go in and dig around the stock cupboard, which said everything had been locked up and, you know, for, for one tub of cream and, and actually, there weren't really more. So yes, we could have done it, but I don't believe it would have been worth our while. Moving forward, do you feel you'll be able to compete with what your customers, so if I'm wandering in and will I be, do you, you, will the price you'd be able to offer me be comparable broadly from what they can get elsewhere? Um, I don't think so. I mean, we don't have a shop. We just have retail space within reception. Anyone that's got a shop, if you think about it, a shop within their spa, they've got two retail assistant salaries to, to cover before they look at any profit from retail. So um, to me, that I, I, I would find, particularly given the current circumstances, I would always find a different use for that space. So I have never really quite believed the, um, you know, what we're told about, retail as an industry and I'm sure I'm going to get lots of terrible emails about this but um for me I don't think we can compete well we obviously can't compete because but your but your team are still very much prescribing oh, as if I come for a treatment and and yeah. you get business from that absolutely we're doing I mean I'll be transparent about it we're doing between 13 and 14% retail to services at Corcott. And given that we're a spa, we do a lot of massage. So if we were to take out the massage, I, I don't know what that would be, but that, you know, we've always compared like for like. Of that, we have one therapist who just, she, she retails for England. Um, she's absolutely phenomenal. So take her out of the equation and it would be significantly less, but they do recommend um and they've done all of this training um but i i wonder what will happen I, I i'll leave it open to see what does happen but you know we've been fairly consistent at colcott and it's certainly worthwhile don't get me wrong but um i'm the I'm, question is on the future the hasn't changed altogether interesting and we said between 20 minutes and half an hour and the half an hour is almost up so i'll leave i'll um, what, what, um, I'll, I'll end with one question. What opportunities do you see for the salon and spa market going forward? Um, well, I think, 
I think our audience has just enlarged massively, hasn't it? So for the last 12 months, we've been told we need to be fitter. Uh, we need to uh, protect our mental health. We need to improve our mental health. We need to find more work-life balance. Um, what better place than the spa and salon industry um, to, to benefit from that? And again, we've all got some catching up to do. So um, this is all really, really good news. Um, preventative self-care. I just think at every price point, um, there are going to be more people wanting our services. So it's now for us to go out and, 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 and show people what we have. Um, and I think that is very exciting. I think flexible working will come out of this. You know, I, I wouldn't be at all surprised and in our reviews, this will come up if people think that actually they don't want to work full time anymore. Um, they've had a lot of time off. In that time, you presumably find lots of things to do to fill it. Uh, we've had the benefit of people having babies in lockdown. We've had the benefit of our chefs having, you know, becoming fathers for the first time and actually spending months with their children never happens in the catering industry there are so many benefits that have come out of that but i can see people's desire for work um i just hope that they're open enough to to share it because i mean particularly in the spa we are able to cope with you know we have therapists that come in and do three hour shifts or two days a week or whatever it all works for us so I think that will be a positive outcome. The working environment of our therapists, I think, you know, obviously post pandemic and when everybody's had a vaccination will have improved for the long term because some of those changes won't go away. Um, we've got better with technology. We've been forced into improving our technology, which will benefit the industry too. Um, and the great outdoors, we all love the great outdoors. So. Um, and we've got 220 acres, so we can really maximise on that. So I think there's loads of opportunity. I think it's been a really tough, really tough 12 months that has really tested me. I'm not going to, I'm, I'm not going to lie about that. I find it hard. Um, but I think there's an exciting future ahead. And I have absolutely no doubt that we will get back to um, full strength. Ladies and gentlemen, Cathy Ball is joining um, two other panellists, Kent Richards and Trent Monday, on a professional beauty online conference that we're running on a reopening on the 7th and 8th of April. So tune into that. Um, I'll, before we go, there's a couple of comments that I've seen now that people have posted. So Michelle Victoria Louise quote, I used to work for Kathy and she was an absolutely amazing boss. So oh. much love and respect for her. And another lady... India pool. Oh, Kathy, India. you are wonderful. My favorite oh. spa always. So a couple of lovely, love, nice comments to close on and genuine comments. Um, Kathy Ball, Calcott Spa, thank you very much. Thank you. All the best.